We come to conclude this series of studies this morning with two sessions. This one, the rise of Babylon the Great, will deal with the first nine verses of, uh, of uh, Genesis 11. And then we're going to have a look at Genesis 11:10 through to chapter 12, verse 3 in the exhortation and see the flip side of what we'll consider here uh, in this session this morning. So let's start with this chart, this well-known chart based upon the writings of uh, Brother Thomas and Elpis Israel uh, and the exposition of Daniel. In this chart, of course, we have the image of Nebuchadnezzar over here on the left-hand side, the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, the, the uh, symbols of the apocalypse that lead us to the right-hand side of the chart where we have, of course, the image of Nebuchadnezzar that will stand complete in the latter days when Gog is in control of the land of Israel. That image cannot stand up until all parts of the four world empires it represented are brought together into one massive image empire. And that will be, of course, the Confederacy of Gog. Now, an essential part of all four empires, of course, was the land of Israel. And so it will not be until Gog is in control of the land of Israel that that image can actually stand up. And that's the great drama, of course, of Daniel chapter 2. It only stands up for a very short time in all of its terror and then Christ and the saints, the stone power of Daniel chapter 2, strike it on the feet, over it goes, and then it's ground to powder over the next 40 years. But, as you can see from this chart, what we have here is the symbology of Revelation chapter 17 overlaid on the image of Nebuchadnezzar that will stand up in the last... That's because, of course, they are one and the same thing. The head of the image is Babylon, and of course that's the thinking power of this system that brings it down upon the mountains of Israel. And so we're going to have a look at the rise of Babylon the Great in Genesis chapter 11. And as I said yesterday, and as I think we demonstrated yesterday, what we have here in this section of scripture is the roots of all Bible prophecy. And that's certainly going to be true in our two sessions uh, today. So, here we've got the Assyro-Babylonian Empire of BC 606, the rise of Nebuchadnezzar, right down to its overthrow by Cyrus, the Persian, in 539 BC. And of course we know that while Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, was foolishly and blasphemously carving up the scroll of scripture that Jeremiah had, had dictated to Barak and was read out to the Jews in the fifth year, the fifth year of Jehoiakim, in that very year, brothers and sisters, while God's own people were rejecting his word, he gave a dream to the greatest monarch of the time, to Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't that amazing? That because his own people rejected his word, he went to the, the monarch of the Gentiles, the king of Babylon, and gave him the revelation of Daniel chapter 2. Okay? So that's where we are, and we of course see that Nebuchadnezzar in that record is called the head of gold. Babylon was the head of the image. And of course it has to play a very important part in the future. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 4, we read that the first was like a lion. So here you've got the way that God viewed these empires. The reason that he gave Nebuchadnezzar the, the dream of an, of an image of a man was that that's how men view themselves. And that's why in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar creates an image all of gold in the human shape, in his own image. That's how men see themselves. But when God comes to deal with them in Daniel 7, he presents them as he sees nations and empires. They're wild beasts, savage beasts who've torn his people Israel apart down through the centuries of time. So here we've got Babylon represented by this beast. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. That is, the Assyrian phase passes. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given unto it. And that, of course, is telling us that the, the empire of Babylon was a little less ruthless than the empire of the Assyrians. You remember, of course, that Gog is represented by the Assyrians in prophecy. And the ruthlessness of Gog is spelled out for us in Zechariah 14. You know, the women ravished, the houses rifled, and all that sort of stuff. That comes from the Assyrian aspect. 
So the Babylonians were a little bit more humane than the Assyrians, but not much more humane. They were still a savage beast. Now you saw this image yesterday of the only known uh, image of Nimrod. Now the Hebrew word Marad is the basis of the name Nimrod. Adding an N before the M, it becomes an infinitive construct in the Hebrew, Nimrod. And, of course, it means the rebel, or we will rebel. And as we saw yesterday, he was the 13th generation from Adam, 13 being a number of rebellion. Now, just a fascinating fact, this is not actually a scriptural phrase, but you take the words that are used in Genesis 10, verse 8, just flick back to Genesis 10, verse 8, you read, and Cush begat Nimrod. So, Nimrod is the son of Cush. So if we take these three Hebrew words, Nimrod, Ben, which means a son, and Cush, his father, it just happens to have a numerical value of 666. Isn't that interesting? Nimrod has a numerical value, and there's the letters, 294, Ben's 52, and Cush is 320. It just happens to be... 666, and I hardly need to remind anyone of Revelation 13, verse 18, that says, Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. This is a fascinating fact uh, along the way. So you can see that the relationship of Nimrod to Babylon uh, is quite plain. Babylon the Great of the latter days. But what about Cush? He doesn't get quite the airplay that Nimrod gets. But he's probably in some ways even more important. Because you see, history records that Cush was also called Kish and Bel. He was the one that settled in Babylon first. He was the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries. In other words, he actually invented the basics of the Catholic catechism. He came from the brain of Cush. He's called Bel. Now, Bel means the confounder. And in actual fact, the symbol for Bel was a club. Now, what do you do with a club? I saw uh, Brother Mark had something that looked like a club he was using to... In fact, here it is here. This is uh, Brother Mark's club, see? What do you do with a club? Well, you bash something and break it into a thousand pieces, don't you? That's exactly where the mind of Cush led. The mind of Cush was taken up by his son Nimrod and Nimrod's rebellion brought about the scattering of the nations from one language into 70, you see. So that was his symbol, a club. In actual fact, in Chaldean, his name means to break in pieces or to scatter abroad. Now, you will find Bel referred to in Isaiah 46 verse 1 Jeremiah 50 verse 2 and 51 44. And by the way, Jeremiah 50 and 51 just happen to be the basis of the whole of the Apocalypse. Much of the language of the Apocalypse is drawn from Jeremiah 50 and 51. And by the way, the name Babylon just happens to occur there 55 times in two chapters. So you know that it dominates. And it's clearly a prophecy of the latter days as well as of the past. Okay, so here you've got a very important individual in Cush, known as Bel. Well, it's not hard to conceive how Bel can become Baal. And that's what happened. You see, Bel, Cush, was later on called Baal and Janus. Now, just remember Janus. This is not a lady's name, by the way. It's the, the, the word we get January from, and you'll see the reason for that in a minute. Okay, so you've got Baal and Janus. That became the names of, of Cush. Cush began the form of false religion that spread throughout Mesopotamia and Canaan. And the principle that we see in operation here is the one that was in operation with Omri and his son Ahab. And I believe that Yahweh in Micah chapter 6 verse 16 uses this formula because it's actually based upon Cush and Nimrod. In the same way that Cush was the, the ideologue, the man who put together the ideas, the doctrines, and his son Nimrod implemented them, so it was true that Omri was the statute maker and Ahab was the performer 
of his father's statutes. That's how it worked with Cush and Nimrod. That's how it worked with Omri and Ahab. So in Micah 6 verse 16 you read, For the statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. And that's how it functions, isn't it? Brain thinks, body does. Okay, Brain thinks, body does. And so it was in the case of Cush and Nimrod. So, in the record of Genesis 11 that we've just read, what we have, of course, is this rebellion in the face of Yahweh to build a tower. Probably one of the, uh, one of the reasons for that is to try and rise above any future floodwaters. And, of course, that wasn't going to happen, was it? Because God promised he wouldn't destroy the earth by a flood anymore. But that's the stupidities of men. So they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth, which is exactly what happened. They were scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, what you see there, of course, is Peter Bruegel's uh, painting of the, of the Tower of Babel, which is completely wrong. It was a ziggurat, as you're going to see, and a ziggurat is actually square. But let's just review what happens here in Genesis 11, verse 4. As they said, let us build us a city and a tower to make us a name. Now that word name there just happens to be Shem. Right? So there's going to be a play here upon this word Shem. It means not just a name, but a name of renown. And so I think there is a possible deliberate play on that name. Who was installed, of course. Shem, we believe, was, as Brother Thomas says in Elpis Israel, we believe was Melchizedek. He was installed as Yahweh's priest in Salem. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18 tells us that. Brother Thomas makes the comment in Elpis Israel, it is probable that Shem was the personage to whom Abraham paid tithes on his return from the slaughter of the kings. And of course the scripture conceals that for good reasons as we said yesterday. Because in Hebrews chapter 7 it's one of the principal arguments about the type of Melchizedek, that he was a type of Christ. In actual fact Paul makes a very important point in Hebrews 7. He says, he says of Melchizedek, that he was made after the likeness of the Son of God. The Son of God wasn't made after Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. So he was set forth, therefore, as a type. The Son of God being much greater than him. So this rebellion of Nimrod and his company sought to promote a counterfeit religion. The ancient Antichrist, brothers and sisters. So what does Antichrist mean? Well, Antichrist means in the place of Christ or instead of Christ. So here was one who was going to replace Christ. Nimrod set out to replace God. Right? He was going to be instead of God. He became the first God king on earth and therefore the first pope. Now all of that's going to come out as we proceed. And I'm going to throw at you an, a mountain of quotations so that you can see that this doesn't come out of my little brain. Okay? This, this comes out of history. And you're going to see its relationship to the Word of God. Now, most of you are quite familiar with this, but it won't hurt to go over this ground again. Some of these quotations I'm pretty sure you haven't seen. And uh, therefore, it will be of interest to you. So what's God's answer to Nimrod's rebellion? Well, in the very beginning... The Elohim said, Genesis 1.26, on the sixth day of creation, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. They were made with the mental and moral capacity of the Almighty himself. But now man defies that objective. Genesis 11 verse 3, go to, they said, let us make brick. So they're going to defy God's objective in their creation. In verse 4, go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Let us make us a name, a shem. But God's response in Genesis 11 verse 7 is, Go to. He sends the Elohim again. Just like they were in the first six days. He sends the Elohim again. Go to. Let us go down and there confound their language. So what we have here, of course, is the intervention of God to overthrow the rebellion of man. Now come to the record of Genesis chapter 10 with me because we read verse 8, let's read it again and then read verse 9 of Genesis chapter 10. 
You know, this is 10 verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one, a gibor, it's a mighty warrior, in the earth. He was a mighty hunter. Now, Rotherham translates it, he became a hero in the earth. Now, this course is telling us that he was, he was a man of some ability when it came to hunting, not only of animals, as we're going to see, but also of men. It says, in verse 9, he became a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before Yahweh. Now that word before there is pani. Twice it is used here. And pani means in front of, before, to the front of, in the presence of, or in the face of. Okay, so that's exactly what it means here. This was not... Nimrod standing humbly in the presence of God. This was Nimrod defying God, flying in the face of God, deliberately setting out to contend with God. That's what it means here, brothers and sisters. And Keel and Dalish, in their commentary, say this. They use the Hebrew tetragrammaton here, which is interesting. In the face of Yahweh can only mean in defiance of Yahweh, as Josephus and the Targums Understand it. So you're ready for this series of uh, quotations? The Targum of Jonathan says this about Nimrod. From the foundation of the world, none was ever found like Nimrod, powerful in hunting and in rebellions against the Lord. And we saw, of course, yesterday, the Assyrian tradition was of mighty hunters. They, they gained their power, did these kings. They retained their power by their ability against wild animals. They were mighty hunters. But they were doing it in the face of Yahweh, in defiance of him. They were going to usurp his authority. Because you see, whereas God gave dominion first to Adam and then to Noah in some degree over the wild animals, and those animals rose up against them, along comes a man who says, well, I'll defend you. God took away that dominion. I'll restore dominion over the wild animals. Right? I'll become God. And they began to worship him as God. Have you ever heard of the Gilgamesh legend? Well, they found tablets. So the question is asked, is Gilgamesh actually Nimrod? Well, this is a quotation. Uh, this is a, a commentary on the, on the tablets that they found. Quota a quotation from those who write about these subjects. Gilgamesh was a vile, filthy man. His arrogance, ruthlessness and depravity were a subject of grave concern for the citizens of Uruk, which is at actually Erech, and we're going to have, we'll come to that city in a moment, Genesis 10 verse 10, they sought to distract his mind from the warrior's daughter and the nobleman's spouse, whom it appears he would not leave in peace. Gives you a bit of an idea of the morality of this man. He was, of course, married to the mother of harlots, Semiramis. Little wonder that the morality wasn't all that great. Dr. David P. Livingston comments about Gilgamesh being Nimrod this way. In the epic, the hero is a vile, filthy, perverted person, yet he is presented as the greatest, strongest hero that ever lived, so that the one who sent the flood will not trouble them anymore. Gilgamesh sets out to kill the perpetrator. Really? Josephus, in his Antiquities, says this about being vengeful for the flood. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach. Really? Yeah, we, we believe it was a worldwide flood. Almost most of us believe it was a worldwide flood. I mean, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet. So... Good luck. And then he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. In the epic, Gilgamesh says, If I fall, I will establish a name for myself. Let us make us a name. Remember that? Genesis 11 verse 4. Gilgamesh is fallen, they will say, in combat with the terrible Huawa. Well, the Huawa of the epic is the biblical Yahweh. Okay. So he's in contention with Yahweh. Josephus in, in his antiquity says this 
Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God, as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence upon his own power. Okay, so he acquired the status of a god in due time, because he protected them from the wild beasts. Alfred Edersheim, of course, you're aware, wrote a lot about scripture, and he talks about the essential characteristics of Nimrod's heathen religion in this quotation. Even Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, regards Nimrod as the father of heathenism, the characteristic of which is to find strength and happiness in sin and not in God. Its essential principle is to reject all that is not seen and to cling to that which is temporal. Now that wouldn't be a human characteristic, would it? All right. Well, of course it is. Idolatry is the religion of sight in opposition to that of faith. Instead of the unseen creator, man regarded that which was visible, the sun, the moon, the stars, as the cause and ruler of all. Nothing much has changed, has it? This is much the same again today. He goes on to say this about the worship of man by man. Or else he converted his heroes, real or imaginary, into gods. The worship of the heavens, the worship of nature or the worship of man, such is, he, is heathenism and idolatry. The worst of it was that man gradually became conformed to his religion. He first imputed his own vices to his gods, and next imitated the vices of his gods. So again, you can see the accuracy of that. Some very good comments there by Alfred Edersheim. So, when you come to scripture, you come across passages like this. 1 Chronicles 1 verse 10. I'm not going to ask you to turn it up. You can do if you wish, but it's on the screen for the sake of time. Cush begat Nimrod, says 1 Chronicles 1 verse 10. He began to be mighty upon the earth. Now the call D paraphrase of this says, Cush begat Nimrod, who began to prevail in wickedness. For he shed innocent blood and rebelled against Jehovah, they use, uh, instead of Yahweh. Okay? So, get a bit of a feel for that. Well, Keel and Dalish add this comment about Nimrod, the hunter of men. So there's a transition here from hunting animals or keeping wild animals from killing people to becoming a hunter of men. And that's the transition we want to follow. So, Keel and Dalish comment. Nimrod was mighty in hunting and that in opposition, in opposition to Yahweh. He founded a powerful kingdom and the founding of this kingdom is shown by the verb with consecutive to have been the consequence or result of his strength in hunting. Hence, if the expression a mighty hunter relates primarily to hunting in the literal sense, we must add to the literal meaning the figurative signification of a hunter of men, a trapper of men by stratagem and force. Nimrod, the hunter, became a tyrant, a powerful hunter of men. So he began by being a hunter of wild animals, therefore he acquired the status of a god in the eyes of the people he was protecting, and then he went on to become a hunter of men. Does it sound like another system that we've known in history that's become a hunter of men? You answer it for yourself. The Jerusalem Targum says this about Nimrod being a hunter of the sons of men. He was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men. And he said to them, Depart from the judgment of the Lord and adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore it is said, as Nimrod is the strong one, strong in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. So all of those quotations were designed to lead us uh, to 
the development of Babylon the Great. We want to now transition from the times of Cush and Nimrod to our own times, to the establishment of the power that Christ and the saints are going to destroy in the events of Armageddon and beyond, especially beyond the power of Babylon the Great. Babylon, of course, became the symbol of rebellion and oppression. That's what we read, didn't we? Have a look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. It says this, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, Hebrew confusion. In the Aramaic and other ancient languages, it means the gate of God. That's what they thought it was, the gate of God. Okay? But it actually is the place of confusion, the confusion of religion. And so Babylon becomes the symbol of rebellion and oppression, especially in relation to religion. And that's why, of course, we read, didn't we, in Genesis 10, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom, Nimrod's kingdom, was Babel, and Erek, and Achad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar, Shinar being the Hebrew equivalent of Samaramis, who was the original queen of that area. This is a quotation you may not have seen. In a book called Samaramis, Queen of Babylon, a gentleman by the name of Bryce Self makes many interesting comments. This is one of them about the city building of both Cain and Nimrod. He says, It was in Mesopotamia that the first cities were built after the flood. And the first of these was quite naturally named after the very first city built by man before the flood. Enoch. And we know who built that. It was Cain, of course. Due to vagaries of linguistic permutation, this name has come down to us as Erek, or Uruk, in Samaria. Not the Samaria of the land of Israel, but Sumeria, okay, of the land of the Babylonians. So it's an interesting quotation, isn't it? Because it's about the city. Now I want you to come back and have a look at these two mega cities that Nimrod built. Chapter 10 of Genesis. I'm going to start at verse 10. See the two mega cities that he built. It says in verse 10 of Genesis 10, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. We just read about that. So the record of Genesis 11 tells us how Babel came into existence. And Erech, and Achat, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar, the land of Semiramis, okay, his wife, Now, the second megacity is mentioned in verses 11 and 12. But if you've got the King James Version, you may just need to make a little adjustment to the translation here. You see what it says in verse 11? Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. Well, the margin in my Bible has an alternative. He went out into Assyria. This is about Nimrod. So the the word Asher there is actually the word for Assyria in the Hebrew. And it's talking about what Nimrod did after he had created one mega city. He decided he was going to create a second one. So he went out of the area of Babylon into Assyria. And he builded these cities, Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kali and Reason between Nineveh and uh, and Kala, the same is a great city. So what's this talking about, brothers and sisters? We well, see, the reason that he had four cities on each occasion is that he chose four towns in a sort of, you know, sort of squarish or, or uh, you know, rectangular shape, and he built a wall between them. He built a wall between them. So that he walled off these places, so that the the land inside was protected from wild animals. Now, when Jonah, you remember when Jonah was told to go to Nineveh to preach, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 3, we read that Nineveh was a city of three days' journey. Really? I mean, you haven't got a city in America that would take you three days to walk through, have you? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that Nineveh itself was 60 miles wide, It means that between these four cities, which were walled off, there was a journey that took you three days to to traverse. And we read that Jonah went one day's journey. In other words, he went 20 miles. 
That's about as much as a human being can walk in a day, comfortably. He went 20 miles. He was only one third of the way across this open ground between these four towns that were joined by a wall. See? So what we've got here are two mega cities. Chose four towns, built walls between them, and they were there for at least 60 miles across. Now you can grow a lot of crops and things in 60 miles, can't you? And you can be protected from the wild animals and other things that might be a problem to you. So that is how Nimrod acquired his God status. All right? He built mega cities and people said, Oh, look, this is a comfortable life here, isn't it? No wild animals to worry about. Who got this for us? Oh, Nimrod, he must be God. He has, he has given us dominion over the wild beasts. He must be God. Yes, he becomes the first God king. He's the founder of the kingdom of men. He's the first pope, brothers and sisters. His title was the Pontifex Maximus. Just keep that one in mind. Okay? We're going to see where that ends up. So here we've got a very powerful man in the face of Yahweh. He has become the Antichrist or the anti-God, the replacement for God. Yes. So you can see where the system of Babylon the Great comes from. So that is why this is so important. Now the earliest Babylonian kings bore the title four races. He's got these two mega cities with four towns, like four races. Okay? When God called Abram and developed from him Israel, the nation was marked by four. There were four mothers for the twelve tribes. There was a four square encampment. There were four standards. The most holy was a perfect cube. Mm-hmm. Got the picture of that? What's God doing? He's going to reverse everything that Nimrod accomplished. And he's going to start with one man. And that man's Abram. And he's going to draw him from the very heart of Nimrudian apostasy. Reverse what Nimrod did. Not just to him, but to all peoples. And ultimately, he'll get him back into the one nation that came from the loins of Abraham, Israel. That's what he's going to do. See, this is the breadth, brothers and sisters, of this subject here in Genesis 9 through 12. It's huge. It's the roots of all Bible prophecy. So he built this tower. As I said, this is Bruegel's fanciful representation of it based on the Colosseum. And, of course, what we know is happening in our world today is that the European Union, when it came together in 1956 with six nations meeting in the Vatican, right, near the Vatican, six nations signing the agreement, the EEC agreement, now of course 27 minus Britain, what they set out to do was to rebuild the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, they wanted to rebuild the Holy Roman Empire. And they represented it by, guess what? Here's their banner. This is Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. And look at the defiance. If this is not Nimrod, look at the defiance. Europe. Many tongues, which God brought about, many tongues, one voice. Look at the defiance of that. They don't care what God did to confuse the tongues of mankind. They're going to overthrow it by their own methods. So they've set out to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And it just so happens that when they weren't able to build the highest tower in the world through lack of finance, they decided they would build another parliament in Strasbourg on the border, and it's right on the border, with France and Germany. Half the city is in France and half the city is a portion of the city is in Germany. Okay? And they built it on the pattern of Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. You see the way that they... It looks like it's an, an unfinished building, doesn't it? See up here? Looks like the builder sort of ran out of money. No, it's deliberate. It's built on the basis of Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. Got a bit of a feel for that? That's what the European Union is all about, with its Catholic foundations. Now, their capital, of course, is Brussels. 
And the headquarters of the European Union is in this building. Now you'll see it happens to be in the shape of a cross. It's skewed, by the way, like their religion. Very <laughs> skewed. <Yeah. laughs> and they had a plan, brothers and sisters, to build over the top of that. So if you take your eye from here down to here, this is the Berlaymont building. This is this building here, down the bottom. They were going to build over the top of this, on four legs, a tower, one kilometre, one point... One kilometre is uh, 0.6 of a mile high. It was going to be the tallest building in the world. All right. They wanted to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Couldn't afford to do it. Maybe God confused them along the way. But anyway, they couldn't afford to do it, so they were content with that building. All right. Based upon Bruegel's painting. Isn't that amazing? We know what we're dealing with, don't we? This is the, this is the system that, the, that Christ and the saints are about to destroy. So let's then go to the centre of its operation, shall we? Do you remember I spoke of that Bell or Cush ended up being called Baal and Janus? Let's have a look at the Janus name that was given to him. Janus was the god of doors and gateways. And also of beginnings. That's why we have a month at the beginning of our year called January. You ever heard of a janitor? You walk into a building and there's a doorway and it has on the door janitor? Yeah. Well, yeah, that comes from Janus. Because you see, he's the guy who cleans up the mess. He's, he's, the, he's the one who's there. You know, he's the, he's the, at the door. That's what Janus means. Gateway or door. Beginning. The temple doors of the temple of Janus faced east and west for the beginning and the ending of the day. Between stood Janus's statue. It had two faces gazing in opposite directions. So here you've got these. This is the this is the uh, the statue of Janus. He's got two faces. Okay facing in the opposite direction, west and east. One face was young, the other was old. That is, Nimrod and his reincarnation, Tamils, is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. The Israelites, Judah, ended up worshipping Tammuz, remember? Yeah. Just like Ahab brought Baal worship into Israel, Manasseh brought Baal worship into Judah. Which is why God sent them into captivity. Genesis symbols were a key and a rooster, a cock. And cardinals, the term cardinals is from the Latin cardo, which just happens to mean hinges. It's based on the god Janus, the god of doors and hinges. Derived from the priests of Janus, god of doors and hinges, who were ordained by Semiramis. Can I give you, you've got one guess as to what colour their robe was. One guess. Red. Red. Yes, the colour worn by cardinals. And by the way, the lesser order of priests wore black. You know why they wore black? Because they tended the sacrificial fires. And you know, you do tend to get charcoal on your garments. But it doesn't show up on a black garment. See, so they wore black. But the cardinals, or at least Semiramis's version, wore red, just like the cardinals of today. Now here's another test for you. What direction does the Vatican face? Anybody know? What direction does it face? You ever been there? Yep. It faces east. But you wouldn't know it from this Google Earth shot, would you? You've got a Google Earth shot here, and here's the Vatican. There's the actual Vatican building, which is 666 feet long, by the way. <laughs> and it faces due east. Now I know, because I walked up here at 11am in the morning. I walked from the Vatican at 11am in the morning after visiting it, and the sun was directly into my face. Straight there. Year was this? Uh, that happened to be uh, July, I think it was, midsummer. Okay? So I was walking up this, this, uh, this is the River Tiber here, of course. Okay? So this is the building that faces east. 
That's because it's actually a temple of Janus. What was Janus's symbol that he was holding in his hand? Do you remember? A key. Look at this. That's the top of the key, yeah. the handle of the key. That's the part you put into the door, into the lock. See? So this building is a temple of Janus in the shape of a key. When you walk in the door, every doorway has got two keys. The two keys of the kingdom of heaven, which they think Peter, of course, their first pope, in their view, had. And moreover, when you go to the top of the Vatican, up to this dome, there's that little section in the middle, that's actually a lookout. And you've got to take 565 steps to get up there, and I was very disappointed it wasn't 666. <laughs> But you get up to the top and you've got to go this narrow little ladder way. And I had a backpack on, so it wasn't easy. And I got up there and you look out. And look over the back of the Vatican, down to the garden bed. Guess what the shape of the flowers was in the garden bed? Two keys. Two keys. There are keys everywhere in this place. Because you see, it happens to be a temple of Janus. It happens to be the habitation of Cush. He created the Catholic Catechism. And sitting in that building is the successor of Nimrod, the Pope. Let's have a look at that. Let's go back to Babylon. You see in the background there the, you know, the round, incorrect shape, so-called Tower of Babylon. But there's something in front of it that's square. That's a ziggurat. Semiramis was the actual creator of the Hanging Gardens, not Nebuchadnezzar. He revived them, but Semiramis was the one who created them. And Semiramis, we saw yesterday, of course, is the woman upon whom Revelation 17 is based. The woman who sits upon the scarlet-coloured beast. Yeah, God's gift to the nations. Her symbol being the dove with its, with its olive branch in its beak. Okay? <laughs> Can't miss that, can you? So here she is. And of course, she had a, a very powerful kingdom in her time. And so they built the Ishtar Gate. Ishtar? Astar. Astar? Semiramis. That's where the Ishtar Gate comes from. Celebrating Semiramis. And of course, it said that every Easter, every Ishtar festival, that's where Easter comes from every Easter or Ishtar festival she brought the kings over whom she ruled to this place and consorted with them she kept them in submission by consorting with them, she was a mother of harlots she had power over the kings of the earth because she kept them under her foot by you know, having relationships with them what a woman she was. No wonder she's picked up in Revelation chapter 17 as the mother of harlots. Because that's where this system comes from. Here's the Ishtar Gate. Celebrated the great festival of Ishtar linked to the notorious orgies of Semiramis. She was the first mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. You can go to Berlin. You can go to Berlin and see that Ishtar Gate intact. It's there in Berlin as a memorial of these things. And so, of course, we know Revelation 17 speaks eloquently about that system that Christ and the saints are going to destroy in the events of Armageddon and beyond. The gift of the sea, her name means. And we read in Revelation 17, verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongue, tongues. Here is the paramour of world rulers. Now I want to finish this study here this morning by taking you to the title Pontifex Maximus. <coughs> this is a photograph taken with my own camera on the floor of the Vatican. It stands not that far away from the statue of Peter who has his big toe worn away with the kissing of millions of people over centuries. Okay? Not that far. And you'll notice, when you walk into the Vatican, and even when you go to the top, right up where I was at the top, and you look over, they've got these little vents. 
hundreds of, well not hundreds, but dozens of vents. On every single one of them is the name of a Pope. And that name is preceded by two letters, P, M, Pontifex Maximus. Every Pope is actually a successor of Nimrod, the first Pope. Do you see it here? Pont, see the P-O-N-T? Okay, that's over here, M-A-X, Pontifex Maximus. We want to examine that title, Pontiff. Where does it come from? Well, as I said, the Pope was acknowledged as the Pontifex Maximus of the Roman Church. It was the title of pagan Roman emperors who were official high priests of the pagan uh, mysteries. And that title can be traced back to Nimrod. The Supreme Pontiff of Paganism bore the Chaldean title, Peter. Did you know that? So if you were the Supreme Pontiff, you bore a title in Chaldean, Peter, or the interpreter of the mysteries. You think that's accidental they chose Peter as their first pope? The office of Pontifex Maximus, or chief priest, was to declare and interpret the divine law and preside over sacred rites. So clearly, it's got a history that comes way from the times of Nimrod. Pontifex Maximus made its way from Babylon to Rome. Let's follow its journey. The Babylonian pagan worship of Nimrod, Semiramis and Tammuz, her son, who was the reincarnation of Nimrod, so she taught, marinated all religions of the world and became the source of the doctrine of the Trinity. Babylon came to Rome by way of Pergamum. The king priest who descended from Nimrod bore the title Pontifex Maximus. We read that in the two Babylons. Pages 240 through 252. Or Supreme Pontiff, meaning bridge maker, like a punt or a bridge. That's where we get the word, you, do you have the word punt in this country? Well, you may not, but we've got punts in Australia. And it's, it's what you use to bridge a gap or to get across a river, see? It bridges a river. You take a punt or a pont. That comes from pontiff. It's a bridge maker. In other words... Claiming to hold the key to the path of connection between this life and the next. The connection between God and man. That's the claim in the name Pontiff. So how did Nimrod Nimrod get to Rome? After the death of Belshazzar in 539 BC, the Persian Emperor Cyrus conquered Babylon and forced the Babylonian princes to flee to Pergamum, which is what we would call in Western Turkey today. You can go to the city of Pergamum. It's one of the seven cities of Asia that Christ wrote to. Well, there was an ecclesia there. There was also shrines to Babylon there. They continued their reign there as king priests of Babylonian paganism. Two Babylons again. In 133 BC, Attalus III, who had no heir, he couldn't pass his kingdom on to his sons because he didn't have any. He was the last king to rule in Pergamum. He bequeathed his kingdom to the Roman Empire in the West. And the kingdom of Pergamon was absorbed by the Roman Empire along with Nimrod's priests and the title Pontifex Maximus and the first emperor of the imperial period of Roman government, the seven forms, it was the sixth form of Roman government, Augustus Caesar adopted the title Pontifex Maximus. Okay? I want you to come finally, brothers and sisters, to Daniel chapter 8. Because Daniel chapter 8 told us this was going to happen. Daniel 8, of course, is about developments in the East. It's about the development of the Roman Empire in the East. And we know what happens in this chapter. We have a ram and a he-goat. The ram is Persia, Medo-Persia. The he-goat is Alexander the Great and his successors, the Grecian Empire. And it's got a notable horn, Alexander, and they strike down the the ram in violence in the three wars that were fought, Granicus, Isis, Arbella, okay, overthrowing the Persian Empire. And then we read this, that Alexander's kingdom was to be broken up into four parts when he died prematurely at 32 years and 8 months. Look at what it says in verse 8 of Daniel chapter 8. 
Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn, Alexander, we know from in, this chapter interprets itself, in verse 20 on, uh, onwards, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So Alexander's empire was broken up into four parts. And we spoke about two of them last night, didn't we? The king of the north and the king of the south, Seleucus and Ptolemy. But then we read this in verse 9. And out of one of them, meaning Pergamum, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. That's a reference to Attalus III bequeathing the kingdom of Pergamum to the rising Roman Empire in the west. And this is what gave them a platform in what we call Turkey today to build their empire in the east. And in 324 AD, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, which became in history the second Rome. We see in what you've just read on that screen, you see the fulfilment of Daniel chapter 8 because you see that kingdom of Pergamum housed the successors of Nimrod and it was taken control of by Bequethel it was taken control of by Rome and the title Pontifex Maximus ended up being adopted by the Caesars and ultimately was installed in Rome and then in Constantinople that's how brothers and sisters we get Babylon the Great so that all comes from Genesis chapter 10 and 11. What a remarkable piece of scripture this is. Well, in our next session, God willing, we're going to see where this all leads.